Hello, I'm Camelia Acosta. Welcome to the Native News Update. It's Thursday, June 9th, and many of the stories you hear here can be found at IndianCountryNews.com. And here's the news for the day from the Associated Press and other Native News sources. Seneca Nation officials have lost another court battle in their legal pursuit to stop the state from collecting tax on sales made to non-Native Americans on Indian land. However, that has not weakened their resolve from not becoming tax collectors for the state. State Supreme Court Justice Donna Sewak on June 8th lifted an order that bars the state from collecting the tax until she ruled on Seneca claims that the state did not follow proper procedures in establishing rules for the collections to commerce. State officials facing a $9.2 billion budget deficit voted a year ago to begin collecting the $4.35 per pack sales and excess taxes on millions of cartons sold by reservation smoke shops to non-Indian customers. It was a break from the policy known as the forbearance adopted by a string of governors who declined to enforce state laws requiring the taxation of sales to the general public. The state plans to impose the tax on Native American sales without going into, onto the reservations by requiring cigarette wholesalers to pay the sales tax before they supply reservation stores. Wholesalers would then pass along the levy to tribal retailers who would have to raise their prices. The state sees the tax as a potential $500,000 a day revenue source. Tribal leaders view it as an encroachment or on tribal sovereignty and a threat to reservation businesses that employ thousands. Seneca President Robert Odawi Porter said the nation will immediately file papers with the appellate division of state Supreme Court to stay the decision and eventually see it overturned. Porter said if the court allow tax collections to begin, well-paying retail jobs will be lost. He also said there will be no change in the Seneca Nation's stand that it will never collect or impose sales tax for the New York State. If the nation's businesses need to shift their product mix to render such onerous tax laws mute, they will, he said. Nation shops are expected to sell brands made by Native Americans on their land, thereby sidestepping regulations aimed at collecting state taxes at the wholesale level off Native American territory before products reach Seneca Nation, Nation for resale. The nonprofit San Francisco Bay Trail Project announced it has suspended a $200,000 grant for the disputed Glen Cove Waterfront Park project. In response, the head of the Vallejo Park Agency said that unless the money is recovered, the controversial project will have to be significantly altered. The funds represent about one-fifth of the park's budget. The announcement is the latest twist in the ongoing controversy surrounding plans to build a park around a Native American burial site at the end of Whitesides Drive in Vallejo, California. The protesters have been occupying the site for 57 days, vowing to remain until the Greater Vallejo Re Recreation District agrees not to grade a hill and build bathrooms in a parking lot on the city-owned property. Recreational officials and two Potwin Indian tribes, however, say the project would protect archaeological resources by covering them with a foot of soil. The South Dakota Supreme Court will hear childhood sexual abuse lawsuits brought by 18 former students of St. Paul's Indian Mission on the Yankton Sioux Reservation in Marty, South Dakota. St. Paul's was one of the half a dozen Catholic boarding schools statewide for Native children and the alleged crimes including rape, sodomy, molestation occurred there before 1975 when the in institution was transferred to the tribe and renamed Marty Indian School. In March, Circuit Court Judge Bradley Zeal dismissed the case, kicking off the appeal. In throwing out the suits, Zeal decided a 2010 amendment to South Dakota Childhood Sexual Abuse Law, HB 1104, should be applied to lawsuits that were filed before it existed as they were. Under HB 1104, plaintiffs over the age of 40 may collect may collect damages only from individual perpetrators of childhood sexual abuse. They may not collect damages from entities such as the Catholic Church or the religious orders that hi hire and or supervise the alleged perpetrators. Since the native plaintiffs in these cases and additional ones against other church boarding schools are over 40 and many of the individual perpetrators are dead, some say the legislature's action and Zeal's decision targeted them. South Dakota state legislators must redraw legislative boundaries to reflect the growing population in the past decade. But a 15-member committee must do so without favoring their own districts, unequally dividing Native American areas, and avoiding costly lawsuits. On June 8th, members of the Joint Legislative Redistricting Committee began this summer, their summer duties and 
One of the biggest concerns highlighted was being sued. Last time the legislature redo the boundaries in 2001, three lawsuits followed, including Boneshirt versus Hazeltine, brought on by the American Civil Liberties Union. The Native American population on reservations is different from other minorities. They are spread out in rural areas and are the most youthful minority population in the nation. For example, in Jackson County, only 52% of the Native American population is of voting age. In South Dakota, the percentage of whites 18 or older compared to Native Americans is much larger, even in the same county. At the urging of legislative staff, the committee decided to visit all seven reservations where the districts will change the most. The redistricting committee will meet again in July and plans to hold public meetings on the seven reservations in late summer. Native American Cheryl Mitchell of Strongsville, Ohio has accepted one of two exemptions for the Island Resort Championship at Sweetgrass, competing among 150 LPGA Future Tour golfers June 24th through the 26th. The 32-year-old mom of two turned pro in 2004, but had focused her energies in the past seven years off to raise her two children. She plans to rekindle her career by playing in the Ladies Professional Tournament as she represents the Potawatomi Nation in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. The Potawatomi, who owns Sweetgrass Golf Club and the Island Resort and Casino, were proud to extend the special invitation to Mitchell. Mitchell is a natal, native of Wapol Island First Nation in Ontario, Canada. The island is the home of the Potawatomi, Ojibwa, and Delaware. She is currently a member of the Canadian Women's Tour. After turning to a professional golf career in 2004, Mitchell placed fifth in the 2005 Royal Canadian Golf Association Women's Tour Championship tied for third at the 2006 Canadian PGA Women's Championship and qualified for the LGPA, L LPGA Canadian Women's Open at the London Hunt Club. For more information on the current championship, you can visit sweetgrassgolfclub.com forward slash championship. The Cigna Foundation recently announced plans to donate $29,000 to the American Indian College Fund to support the Tribal Scholars Healthcare Program. The Tribal Scholars Healthcare Program provides college scholarships to Native students studying at tribal colleges and universities as well as mainstream institutions. The scholarship money will be given to Native students that are studying pre-medicine, pharmaceuticals, nursing, dentistry, or health technology at schools in Arizona, Colorado, Washington, and California. Also students studying social and behavioral sciences, public health, chemical dependency, medical office management, medical assistance studies, medical transcriptionist, or nursing at tribal colleges in Arizona, Wisconsin, or Washington are also eligible for one of these scholarships. The Cigna Foundation is excited to award this grant money as a way to help reduce the disparities seen in the U.S. healthcare system. The Cigna Foundation hopes that these scholarships will allow American Indian students to return to their homes and serve their communities in such a way that improves the local health care system for Native Americans. Lydia Nibley's Two Spirits examines the tragic story of a mother's loss of her son with a look at the largely unknown history of a time when the world wasn't simply divided into male and female and many Native American cultures held place of honor for people of integrated genders. The program explores the life and death of Fred Martinez and the ancient Native American Two-Spirit tradition. Two-Spirits analyzes issues of national concern, including the bullying and violence commonly faced by LGBT people and the epidemic of LGBT teen suicide. It also reveals the range of gender expression that has long been, has long been seen as a healthy part of many of indigenous cultures of North America and of the Navajo culture in particular. For the first time in film, Two Spirits tells the stories from the Navajo tradition of four genders. The first gender is the feminine ge woman, the second is the masculine man, the third is the male embodied person who has a feminine essence, the fourth is the female embodied person who has a masculine essence. Two Spirits will premiere on the Emmy Award winning PBS series Independent Lenses, hosted by America Ferreira, Tuesday, June 14th. You can check your lo local listings for times. Dr. Herbert J. Wilson of Bismarck has been awarded the Bernard Gregory Award for Diversity by the American Lung Association. Wilson provided care to members of the Mandan, Arikara, and Hidatsa tribal communities at Fort Berthold Reservation for more than 50 years. Originally from New England, Dr. Wilson was assigned to the North Dakota Reservation in the early 1950s under a one-year obligation with the United States Public Health Service. 
the only physician in the area, he soon became well known and well respected by the native communities which had struggled with tuberculos tuberculosis and other health problems for many years. Wilson was deeply moved by the people he met in North Dakota and spent the next 50 years serving both the native and non-native population as a family practitioner. He has served as a volunteer for the American Lung Association in North Dakota throughout his medical career and long after he retired in 1995. He is still active with the ALA in North Dakota, which honored him in 1992 by naming him the first recipient of its Outstanding Voluntary Service Award. Harold Wimmer is CEO of the American Lung Association of the Upper Midwest in his nomination letter for the National Award said his leadership and actions have made a real difference in the lives of thousands of Native Americans. Former Lady Monarch assistant coach Karen Barefoot, who last season led Ellen University women's basketball team to its first ever Division I postseason appearance, has been named Old Dominion University's new head women's basketball coach. Barefoot became just the sixth head coach in Lady Monarch basketball history and first new hire since 1987. Barefoot, the school's first Native American head coaching hire, takes over the program that has reached postseason play in 19 of its 20 years and has won 929 games, the third most all-time in women's basketball history. Barefoot, who hails from Newport News, Virginia, has a career head coaching score of 209 to 144, resulting in 11 winning seasons. Aside from Elan, Barefoot has also held the head coaching position at Division II Lenora Ryan College and at the Apprentice School. As a former student athlete at Christopher Newport in Virginia, Barefoot still holds the recognition of being the first player in NCAA history, male or female, to score over 2,000 points and accumulate and accumulate 1,000 assists during her career. For four consecutive seasons, Barefoot led the nation in assists and in CNU's all-time leader assists and steals and in second all-time in scoring. A three-time Kodiak WBCA All-American, she has been inducted into the CNU Athletic Hall of Fame and her, had her college jersey retired. And in 2006, she was named to USA South's 25th anniversary team. And just a reminder that tomorrow, June 10th, we will not be airing the Native News Update as we will be going doing a live broadcast for the 2011 Mother Earth Water Walkers. And that's the latest roundup of news from Indian Country on this edition of the Native News Update. I'd like to thank you for joining me and have a grand day.